Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Mariam Ektiar, Senior Research Associate in the Department of Islamic Art, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to another event surrounding uh, the opening of our new galleries for the arts of the Arab lands, uh, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and later South Asia. And tonight, uh, we're very fortunate to have a distinguished scholar and speaker uh, with us, uh, Dr. Nicholas Warner. Um, Dr. Warner trained as an architect at Cambridge University in the Graduate School of uh, Design of Harvard University. Since 1993, he's been based in Egypt, uh, where he's directed a number of projects related to the documentation, preservation, and presentation of historic structures and archaeological material. He joined the Leiden excavations in 2003 for the design of a protective shelter over the tomb of Mary, Mary Neis, is that correct? <laughs> and planned the conservation and site management project, which was approved by the Supreme Council for Antiquities in 2005. Um, t tonight, uh, Dr. Warner's talk will be is entitled The True Description of Cairo, a 16th Century Venetian View. And before uh, I uh, welcome him and um, ask him to uh, start his talk, I'd like to acknowledge the generosity of um, and the support of the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, uh, the organization who's made tonight's <coughs> lecture possible. I'm going to turn the podium to Dr. Warner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ekhtiar, and it's a pleasure to be here in New York this evening. Um, a great world city like Cairo, I should say. And my thanks also to the Education Department for assisting me in um, coming here so that I can speak to you this evening. Tonight, I would like you to welcome you to Cairo, which is the city that has been my home for the last 20 years. In the 14th century, it was dubbed the Ant Hill of Humanity by the great um, philosopher and, and scholar Ibn Khaldun. And in those days, you know, it had a much, much smaller population. Um, we're not looking at it through the 14th century lens of history. We're looking at it through the 16th century lens tonight, when the population of the city was approximately 200,000. Today, it's a city of 20 million. And uh, everything that you see tonight is now surrounded by a very large mass of, of uh, modern construction. So it is the core of the of the city that we're going to be looking at um, this evening. It does, however, contain this core, what I believe is the greatest concentration of urban Islamic architecture of any of the cities of, of the Darul Islam of the Islamic world. And of course, in that core were produced many of the objects from uh, Egypt that you see upstairs in the beautiful new Islamic galleries upstairs. So this is where they all come from. Prior to the 16th century, views of cities um, had a more or less fragmentary and, and sometimes completely fictive character. Um, I hope you've had a chance to look at the view of Cairo as it's reproduced in the facsimile um, on your way in, uh, which is the facsimile of the original uh, map or view, which is two meters by one meter. This is a much, much smaller illuminated manuscript from the 15th century, from 1470. And it's a collection of city views that we used to illustrate a geography by uh, Ptolemy. And during the Renaissance, um, a number of Ptolemy was, was rediscovered. And uh, a number of these illustrated manuscripts uh, of Ptolemy contained city views, not just uh, European cities, but cities in the Islamic world. Um, this particular one was made in, in Florence in 1470. The view does contain uh, a number of the prominent elements of the city, such as the, the walls um, and the citadel, uh, 
and the network of canals that went from the Nile through the city, as well as one or two of the prominent uh, sites like uh, the famous Balsam Garden, uh, which you see on the, on the far left of, of the image, uh, which were well known to uh, travelers even in that time. Also, it's very significant because it introduces the idea of the aerial view of a city, the aerial view being a, a method of describing the city. And in Ptolemy's text, he talks about the distinction between geography um, as being a holistic study of the whole world and the things that are contained in it, and something called chorography, which is a description or drawing of an individual element of that world. So cities fall into this category. Um, and it's from this that we get the idea of Renaissance city portraits. And again, upstairs in the galleries upstairs at the moment, you have a wonderful exhibition about Renaissance portraiture. But it should be remembered that that portraiture, idea of portraiture didn't just extend to people, but, but also uh, extended to cities. So in, in Italian, they call them ritratti, which is the same word for uh, a portrait. Much more widespread, however, were images that were printed. Um, the Ptolemy uh, that, that you just saw was a manuscript, a um, very expensive object. Um, much more widespread were these printed city views which accompanied pilgrimage narratives. And they can be more or less accurate. You can see here, this is a particularly popular example which went through 16 different editions in 100 years. So um, a very, very widely spread um, idea of, of what a city like Cairo looked like. So, in fact, it was divided into two. Babylon, the ancient uh, city developed around the Roman fortress of Babylon, uh, and the city of, of, of Cairo, al Cairo itself, which is what you see on the right, with um, perhaps some of the earlier representations of, of minarets. Another pilgrimage manual, again very widely spread, was one produced by um, Bernard von Bredenbach, um, and here again we have some of the well-known features by now of the city uh, combined with uh, elements from the Christian itinerary or pilgrimage uh, itinerary. Uh, many pilgrims going to the Holy Land would have passed through Cairo, so these were essentially um, illustrations to guidebooks, to the, the first guidebooks to the Holy Land. And here we have Cairo on, on that bank of the Nile with a collection of, of buildings and, and sites of, of interest. There are very, very few um, early views of the city painted by eyewitness um, uh, reporters, and this is one of them. Again, it's an Italian one. And you can see all of these views have the characteristic that they show a kind of European architecture. And in this one, uh, minarets have actually been substituted with, with uh, obelisks, which is uh, quite an interesting feature. Um, the minaret was, was not, not terribly well understood. Um, but even in this, some of the major elements of the city are correctly disposed on, in their correct, so to say, topographical relationship. Now, the portrait of Cairo that was uh, created by a Venetian printer called Matteo Pagano uh, in 1549 is a, an altogether different kind of representation in terms of its detail and its topography. It is an expression uh, of this idea of Ptolemy's of, of chorography, and it is one of numerous city portraits or large prints that are distinguished by their scale and their detail. All of these objects, these prints, are very, very rare today because of the very, very large dimensions of the, of the assembled object, the two meters by one meter. They're all hand printed on, uh, by woodblock on pieces of paper that would be assembled into a single large view. Um, very few of them survive. There are only two <laughs> copies of this that survive in the world, and one of them was on display here in 2007 um, uh, in the exhibition uh, that was organized by Stefano Carboni on the theme of Venice and the East. So when they were actually made, the, the lucky ones would have been backed onto a linen roll and stored as a roll. Um, some of the less fortunate ones would have been pasted onto walls, so they would have been very ephemeral objects you know, that would, would only last as, as long as people uh, didn't redecorate the wall. Um, 
before anybody asked me, I thought I would forestall this question, which is, where is the epicenter of recent political events in Egypt? Um, it is just there by the, the River Nile there in a, in a sandbank that um, has yet to be fully formed. The, the actual view was accompanied by a small booklet that was printed in Latin, um, and this is actually dated, and it's from this that the date of the, of the view of the city is derived. This, too, only survives in, in uh, a couple of impressions. Again, it's a very rare uh, object, um, and as you see, it's called the, the description of, of Cairo, the city of Cairo, which is also called Misr or Masr. And uh, these two names of, of Misr and al Qahira are the names by which the city um, is, is how it was traditionally known. And they do refer, actually, to two distinct parts of the city, one of which was Fustat, the first Arab city in, in Africa, actually, um, and al Qahira, which was the later Fatimid city that grew up alongside it. The book, this little booklet, contains um, introductory chapters about Islam and um, also <laughs> details about the city um, and it also explains a number of the annotations that occur on the map which were written in Venetian dialect uh, and if you look at the view and you'll see them again illustrated in the talk you'll see that there are very many numerous um, little legends that accompany particular images and particular vignettes on the view and the reason that it was done in Latin was to uh, to actually increase the the um, the distribution of of the of, of the of the knowledge, so to speak, because more people could deal with the Latin than could deal with the uh, dialect Venetian. There was a historical attribution of of the authorship of this view. You'll note of this uh, booklet. You'll notice that there's no name of an author there, but um, from the 16th century there were attributions as to who had written it. Uh, and these attributions were confirmed by a, a definitive analysis of the text, which was carried out in the 1960s, um, and it was attributed at that point to somebody who uh, is known to many scholars as the, the crazy father of Orientalism. And it's this gentleman here, a gentleman called Guillaume Postel, who was a, a French cosmographer and linguist, <coughs> Um, his dates are 1510 to 1581. I'm not going to talk a great deal about Postel because he's a very complicated person, um, but I will say that he had um, an astonishing grasp of languages, um, and he produced the best available Arabic grammar in 1538. Uh, and he was the first professor of Arabic uh, at Francis I's humanist foundation, the Collège Royal in, in Paris. He also traveled extensively in the, in the Middle East, in the Levant, um, although it seems that he never went to Egypt. And he traveled in order to collect manuscripts. And those manuscripts are today the foundation of the, of the collection uh, in the Vatican. They went through several hands, but they formed the backbone of the Vatican collection. He spent quite a lot of time in Venice in the, in the 1540s, which is probably when he met the printer Matteo Pagano uh, and embarked on their collaboration. Here you see uh, a title page from a book uh, that he wrote on languages, uh, different languages, which was essentially an exercise in alphabet recognition more than anything else. Um, and uh, he spent the last 28 years of his life actually in a lunatic asylum in Paris teaching Arabic to Europe's next generation of Arabic scholars, um, people like Scaliger and Raphaelengius were his students. So. Even though he was mad, um, he carried on this. this uh, he was responsible for continuing the tradition of, 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 of learning as far as Arabic was concerned in, in Europe. He also has the distinction of being um, put in prison by not only the Protestants but also the Catholics for his unorthodox religious beliefs. This is before he was uh, completely uh, declared insane, you say. So, this uh, passion for languages is, in fact, apparent in the view of Cairo, where the names of the city are uh, transcribed in a variety of languages, not all of them Eastern. So these are all actually present on the view. I'm sad to say that the text itself of the, of the um, 
of the booklet that he wrote is actually quite dull. The most exciting bits are those that he copied from an unpublished manuscript of Leo Africanus um, on Africa. Um, and uh, those bits also found their way into the text. But generally speaking, its utility is that it is a springboard for the examination of the details of, of the view. Now, it's not for nothing that, um, that the view is called a true description. And you see here the words are separated by an allegory, allegory of the figure of virtue here, a female figure of virtue holding a cross and a chalice. Um, Veracity was an extremely important part of this operation, and uh, a lot of people went to a great deal of trouble to ensure the details of these views were collected by eyewitnesses and, and transcribed in as accurate a manner as possible. And they did increase their, their saleability, I think, from, from being uh, what was considered to be true to life. However, this veracity was really uh, more to do with the content of the view rather than things like scale. So you'll, you'll notice that, for example, in this view, the figures are quite large relative to the uh, scale of the buildings that are represented. There's an astonishing amount of detail in, in the view. Uh, this little uh, garden, the Bustan of the Amir, the Garden of the Amir, measures approximately one inch by one inch on the map. Um, so the details are uh, another way in which the truth of the image is actually um, conveyed. It was very important to also provide a, a reliable geographic and, and natural context for uh, the city of Cairo. So the Nile features quite prominently in the composition and you can also see here a little figure who's taken off his turban and clothes and has gone swimming in the Nile um, there. The mountains of the Mukattam range uh, to the east of the city are represented, and you can see here it's called Monte Carafa, which is a reference to the Carafa, the great cemetery that was at the foot of these mountains. And also we have uh, the representation of uh, flora and fauna. So here you see a very obvious example, which is the, the, the representation of camels, um, quite unusual in, in, in Europe at that time, um, but something that would definitely give the flavor of the, of the place to, to the viewer. Even more particular to Egypt, of course, were the crocodiles, which were a source of great fascination to uh, early travelers, um, sometimes erroneously referred to as the poisson du Nil, um, <laughs> which, um, but, but uh, they were still a, a feature of, of the landscape uh, since the Aswan Dam wasn't built until the late 20th century. Crocodiles were ever present in the Nile. <coughs> as far as flora is concerned, we have uh, characteristic trees such as uh, this cassia tree, um, also known occasionally as the pudding pipe tree, uh, which was used for um, a laxative. The beans were used for, for a laxative, uh, a purgative. Um, some people would say that you know, the Egyptian diet wouldn't require it, but uh, I think it obviously it did. Alongside the animals and trees, of course, there were the people, the, the local population, and they appear in very many of these vignettes um, depicted with their, uh, their, their costume. Costume was of great interest. So you can see here a Mamluk riding on a horse with his characteristic headdress, uh, which is the, the uh, takea, this sort of bearskin-like object that they wear, um, and speaking to a, a veiled woman on, um, on, his, on his side there, also dressed uh, in what was believed to be a characteristic way. Women were a source of great fascination, you know, and the clothes that, that they wore were, were of great interest. Um, this, is, this is quite uh, an interesting representation in itself because every aspect of, of the figure is treated as if it was rotated. So you have a side view, a three-quarter view, uh, a front view, and a back view, all of the same figure at the same time. So you actually have this... this, this uh, the lady is, is rotated, as it were, graphically, um, so that you can get a full picture of what she um, was wearing. Uh, in fact, I don't think it differed very markedly from what uh, high-class Venetian ladies would have been wearing at the same time. Um, but uh, certainly, the, the woman of Cairo, uh, whether this period or later period, is a subject of enormous fascination, and it's almost sort of trope on its own <laughs> that could be uh, 
explored further. Small vignettes um, abound on the map. So here we have an example which is the water carriers um, collecting water from the river to distribute it through the city, through cisterns and sabils, through drinking um, points. Uh, and there was a guild of at least 4,000 men and, uh, who used not only their own two legs but also camels and donkeys to transport the water a considerable distance to the city. Um, they remained a common sight, in fact, until the 19th century. And here we have a, a photograph of, of one of these water carriers at the end of the 19th century, plying his trade. Water wheels also, uh, an interesting feature for European viewers, um, and they also continued right through to the 19th century. Piped water was only introduced in Cairo, in fact, at the end of the very end of the 19th century, and it took some time to work its way through to most areas of, of the city. The Mamluks, who controlled the city until 1517, um, are represented in the form of um, soldiers who are carrying out, or horsemen who are carrying out furasir exercises, these, these exercises of horsemanship. The Mamluks were very, very renowned for their skill with the bow and the lance whilst on horseback. Uh, and here we have an example of a sort of portrayal of, of the, the Mamluks carrying out these exercises and around the city. And there were dedicated um, training grounds for this activity to take place in Cairo even at this time. Veracity could also be conveyed in different ways. It took me a very long time before I spotted this little figure um, of a man performing his ablutions in the River Nile um, and is actually even being pointed out you know, by, by one of the uh, people at the bottom left corner to drawing our attention to this fact. Um, this is not a unique representation in, 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 um, in uh, printmaking. Uh, very often you have people performing bodily functions who are sort of hidden away in the composition that you, you don't notice at first. More interesting in some ways is this representation, which shows the camel walking out of the frame of the map. So it is a way in which the actual uh, the, 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 the barrier between the viewer and, and the object that is being viewed is broken down. This is again another uh, very uh, important Renaissance conceit, if you like, but it's quite nice that it's being actually executed in this case with a, with a, with a figure of the camel stepping out towards you. The wonders of Egypt, the, often referred to as the mirabilia of Egypt, um, and Cairo in particular, are another feature of the view. Here we have the pyramids of Giza, um, which are represented in this very pointy style. Um, I don't know if there are any Egyptologists here who crept over from next door, but these are amongst the earliest representations of pyramids um, that we have. Um, and it wasn't until the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, in fact, that um, even in eyewitness views, you find these pyramids drawn with a very, very steep angle. So that wasn't changed until much, much later um, in graphic uh, terms. The Sphinx, um, in, European, in European eyes, always, always a woman um, because of the weight of prejudice uh, of, of, of Greek mythology. Um, but of course, in, in, uh, in Arabic, the Sphinx is known as Abul Hol, the father of terrors, um, and was always male. So here we have the juxtaposition of, of the male and, and female sphinxes. Sites associated with the Holy Family stay in Egypt, um, where they escaped uh, because of the fear of Herod, as it says there in the Venetian legend that accompanies this little vignette. They went to Matarea, which is a place just to the northeast of the main uh, part of historic Cairo. So sites associated with the Holy Family are also included. Old Cairo, Masr al Attica, which is um, known also as, as Babylon, is, is shown represented. But very interestingly, and I think this is quite significant, not a single church is shown there. This is a part of Cairo where um, all of the Christian churches were, were um, concentrated, in fact. And yet on the view, we don't have a single representation of a church. And I think that that is um, deliberate, as I will explain further on. Historical truth is portrayed. We have here the uh, Ottoman army arriving sneakily outmaneuvering the Mamluks who were waiting on the wrong side of the city. They crept around the Mokhatam Hills uh, 
and conquered Cairo, led by Sultan Selim the Grim. And here we have, of course, a date. So it's very specific. You know, we're actually given the date that 11th of April, 1517. And references also made to Tuman Bai, who is the last Mamluk Sultan who was hanged from Babzuela by Sultan Selim of um, Turkey. Now I'd just like to consider the, the meat of the view for me, which is the representation of the city itself. Um, this is a city, we must bear in mind, where travelers often describe the streets as being so dark that even in the middle of the day, the bats would be flying through the streets because the sunlight would not penetrate to the, to the full depth of the street. So as you see, very, very, very dense um, landscape and it's substantially filled with residential buildings, and they're shown with all flat roofs, which is a complete, uh, completely accurate uh, idea of, of what houses were in, in Egypt. And you see the mosques. Occasionally, uh, there's a mosque, which is known as a gamma, uh, distinguished by a dome and very often a, a minaret. One thing that I should point out is that there are no interiors shown here, so there are no courtyards. It's all a description of, of the exterior volume of, of the constructions, uh, and that may be as a result of the fact that foreigners were not allowed to go inside mosques. Certainly, um, at this date, it's unlikely that they would get in, and nor would they get into very many domestic contexts. I think the interesting thing here, though, is that when you look that a photograph of uh, Cairo as it is today, um, this is taken from a helicopter, actually it's a remarkably similar texture that you have, even though almost all of the buildings, with the exception of the major monuments that you see there, um, are new. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's in fact, I think quite uh, uh, texturally at least, it's, it's a very, it's a very um, plausible thing that we're, we're looking at despite all of the distortions of scale and, and things like that. So here, uh, I'm sure that you can't read all of this, but it just shows you that the, the composition of the, of the view, which is made up of these 21 sheets, and actually um, there are all of the main arteries of the city, the streets of the city are described, as well as individual buildings of importance. So they're all actually on the view as are some of the peripheral settlements, which are all shown in their correct relationship to the city, a little port called Bulak, which is on the River Nile, and other settlements like Imbaba and Shubra and Roda and Giza, all uh, cities that, uh, all areas of the city today that um, are identifiable as discrete entities within Cairo. The great uh, Mamluk Cemetery, Royal Mamluk Cemetery, to the east of the city walls is also shown. And interestingly, of course, by the end of the uh, 19th century, the only parts of these complexes that survived were the domed mausolea of the, of the sultans. Um, but they were originally part of much larger complexes, as is shown on the view, which would include madrasas for, for Sufis, uh, bathhouses, other structures, residential accommodation, things like that. And so, in a way, this is um, a much more accurate view of the city than the photograph that you see at the top, as it was, at least. The Great Canal of Cairo that, uh, that came from the Nile and passed through the city, feeding water into the city after the inundation that took place on an annual basis in, in September, is also shown uh, here with the bridges over the canal being shown. Uh, about 12 bridges in all are shown. This was a very ancient canal originally um, started by Pharaoh Nectanebo II, uh, which linked Cairo um, to the Red Sea. And it was retained more or less uh, in, 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 its, in, its, in its first section, at least, in, through the Islamic period. Um, and that's what it looked like at the time of the description de l'Egypte, um, when the French expedition came to Cairo. And it had the function of providing uh, water to some of the urban lakes, which are quite well known um, uh, in the topography of the city. You can see here on the left um, the water running from the canal into this lake uh, called Esbekea, or Isbekia, as they say in the Venetian there. Um, 
On the right, you have the same space represented in the map of Cairo from the Description de l'Egypte, so the end of the 18th century. Um, interestingly, this space was only flooded part of the year during the inundation of the Nile, and the rest of the year it was a dry place which was used for grazing cattle and things like that. So I think that the map makers or the view makers <coughs> were a bit confused about this. So they actually ended up representing it twice, once in a dry condition and once in a, in a wet condition there on, on the left. But it is the same place and it's got the same name. Um, I think quite an understandable confusion. <laughs> the walls of the city on the east side of the city uh, are shown quite clearly, along with ruined structures within the walls. You can see just inside there's some collapsed walls there, and hills on the far side of the walls, which were the ancient rubbish mounds of the city, very uh, prominent feature of, of the city. You can see it in the 19th century photograph on the bottom, the view is actually taken from the top of one of these rubbish mounds, which um, is entirely artificial and is 50 meters high. Um, and these walls were built from the 10th to the 12th century. So they differ from Fatimid to Ayyubid periods. Um, but even from the Fatimid period, people started dumping building rubbish, building rubble outside the walls. So soon the walls lost any defensive uh, purpose that they might have had because they were completely overtopped by the rubbish mounds, which fascinated most European visitors to the city. So you frequently have this reference to mountains of rubbish. Scovazze is the, is the Venetian dialect word for rubbish. Um, and here is a view of, of what they looked like when I first went to Egypt in 1992, um, before the Arhan had transformed this area into a park. Uh, and now if you go, uh, the only thing that you have this is a reminder of the ancient condition, uh, is the height uh, where you look down onto the city from these mounds. The northern walls of the city are also represented, um, and today they have been cleared um, after a, a second campaign of clearance, so you can see this whole edge of the city has been exposed once again. One of the gates, the Fatimid gates, uh, within the northern walls, the Bab al-Nasr, is shown here. Um, you can just see the, the little lettering there on the, on the right-hand side. Um, a, a very famous uh, piece of architecture, which is uh, often drawn by visitors to Egypt. And this is a 19th century view, watercolor of, of the Bab al-Nasr. <coughs> on the other side, we have uh, the other gate. These gates were built in the end of the 11th century. Uh, this is the one where Tuman Bay was, was hung by um, the Ottomans, the Ottoman forces, the famous gate of Babzuela, with its twin minarets built by Sultan Muayyad Sheikh above the Fatimid gate, above the 11th century gate of, of, uh, of Babzuela. And you can see that, in fact, it shows just stumps of, of, of minarets. The representation is not very clear, um, but the text is certainly um, self-explanatory. The citadel um, is shown in a, in a particular European way. Um, it, it wouldn't look amiss in, in, uh, in the Lorenzetti paintings of, of Siena, this kind of architecture that you see here, with the exception of the minarets. Um, and a very small detail of the central minaret, worth pointing out, is the, is the presence of hanging brackets for lamps. So minarets were usually lit up, particularly during Ramadan, um, the month of Ramadan, the, the fasting month. Um, and there are, again, descriptions of the city being lit up at night, you know, so uh, the Christians were all terrified because they regarded the, the lighting of the city by night as being a symbol of Islamic power, which none of the European cities could ever hope to match. So um, there are interesting descriptions about that. So the, the citadel obviously contained uh, uh, within its walls numerous palaces and also halls of justice and residential areas and barracks and things like that. Um, so it was a very important piece of, of the city's topography, um, <coughs> the silhouette of which is somewhat different now because of the construction of Muhammad Ali's mosque in the uh, 19th century. There are some other major civil engineering achievements which are shown. This is the aqueduct, uh, uh, which was built primarily by the Sultan al-Nasr Muhammad um, in the 14th century and later extended. 
Uh, and this is interestingly shown in its wrong location. This is one of the very few examples of a, of a misplaced topographic element. And I think that, in fact, the reason for this is because if they had shown it in its correct location, it would just be a line. Uh, and you would have none of the elevational information contained in this particular uh, representation because the distinctive thing about this aqueduct is you know, this line of arches that can be seen from quite a long way away. Uh, this is, most of the arches have been blocked up now. On the other side of the river, on the west bank of the river, there's a, a, a remarkable piece of architecture which has now totally disappeared. This was a, a gigantic bridge come causeway known as the Anathar of Giza, which was built by um, Karakush, who was the, the, um, the marshal of Salahadin, the constructor of the Cairo citadel. Um, and this is late, 20th, uh, late 12th century construction. <laughs> and it had a dual purpose. And one of the purposes was to transport the stone that was taken from the pyramids and reused to construct the walls of Cairo that you have seen in some of the earlier uh, images just now. So that was one purpose. And the other purpose was to control the inundation and irrigation of this area um, during the, 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 the period of the, of the Nile flood. Um, of course, the pyramid casings were all stripped for the use, uh, for use in, in building in, in, in Cairo, um, and probably not just the casings, but here you see an example of a piece of pharaonic spolia, a lintel from a pharaonic temple probably, reused um, in uh, a, a Hanka, a, a, a Sufi um, congregational establishment um, in Cairo here. So. So a lot of building material was taken from Giza. This survived, this construction of the Anathar of Giza, the Bridge of Giza, survived until, more or less, until the end of the 18th century, but has now totally disappeared. When we look at the core of the city itself, um, we find markets. The famous Khan al-Khalili market is mentioned, um, as is the, the Jewish area, which goes by the name of the Judeca, which is the Venetian word for the Jewish quarter, um, and th th these areas were obviously of extreme importance in the commercial life of the city. At the center of, of, uh, of, the, of the very center of the city, there was this structure uh, in the Bain al-Kasrain, the area between the two Fatimid palaces, um, the, the Madrasa and Mar Maristan, the hospital of Kalawun, Sultan Kalawun, a 13th century building, um, which was famous um, at the time the 16th century for the production of theriac, which was a wonder drug, the, the wonder drug of the Middle Ages, which was actually made from snakes. Um, and so annually there was an enormous collection of snakes that went on, and they, they reduced the snakes into pills, which were then sold to pilgrims, usually, um, uh, who were on their pilgrimage to the, to the Holy Land. And it was a, it was a, it was a wonder drug, I and mean, it cured everything from snake bites to gout, anything you could possibly think of. When we look at the architecture of the houses, we see things that are both familiar and unfamiliar, particularly familiar if you're a Venetian, because these buildings, which are actually shown along the canal of Cairo, are very similar to the buildings that lined um, the, the Great Canal in, in, in Venice. So the architecture, there is a kind of parallelism here, which probably did not exist um, in reality. At the same time, we have these very strange little L-shaped uh, representations on the roofs, and I've puzzled about this for a long time. I couldn't work out what these things were, but then I finally realized that they must be representations of the traditional wind scoops that you would find on the top of every Cairo house. Um, very few of these survive to this day, but you can see an example here. Um, wooden structures which would channel the wind, the cooling wind, which always came from the northwest, into the interior of the houses. Mosques. Lots of different kinds of domes are represented. This gives you an idea of the observational uh, powers of the people who created this view. Uh, we have uh, domes that are ribbed, stone ribbed domes. We have domes that are spiral ribbed. We have domes that are covered in lead sheet. We have domes with arabesque carving on them. And we have domes that are bulbous and wooden. And most of these have now disappeared, the wooden ones. But I'm sure that the city had many, many more of them. This is not a very Islamic piece of architecture, it would seem. Um, 
but there it is. St. Mark's in Venice, uh, reappearing in, in uh, the historic area of Cairo. Um, people have talked a lot about the orientalizing aspect of, of this building, um, but there's certainly nothing quite like it in, in Egypt. So I think this is another example of the Venetians imposing their idea of, of, uh, of, of what perhaps what they thought of was the, the original St. Mark's design, <laughs> um, uh, imposing it on, on Cairo. This is another very famous mosque in, in, uh, in Cairo, the mosque of the Madrasa of Sultan Hassan, which is just below the citadel, um, and 1356 in date. And th this is an interesting representation because it shows the mosque with two minarets of the same size. And if you look at the building today, you'll notice one minaret is much, much smaller than the other. And that's because the minaret on the right collapsed, in the photograph, collapsed in 1619 and was rebuilt by the Ottomans in the Mameluk style. But the representation we have on the view shows the two minarets of identical size. So despite some of the remarkable observations that I think you can see in the, in the view, um, there are some omissions. I've mentioned the fact that there are no, courtyard, there are no interiors of courtyards of mosques. So this is uh, an aerial view of the mosque of Ibn Tulun. Um, and, uh, you know, despite that, though, we have named districts, we have key monuments. The question arises, how was this view created? Because it is an imaginary, entirely imaginary perspective that we are dealing with here. Um, and so the only answer that I have for that is that it was created from a series of, of, of sketches that were made by people who were experienced with cartography, who could then assemble them into a complete composition. And the people who were most capable of doing that were the Venetians, and the Venetians were the trading partners of the Mamluks up until uh, the time of the Ottoman conquest in 1517. Um, so I think that actually that is one of the reasons why I would like to try and recalibrate the date of this image um, to that <coughs> period. And the, I will now just talk a little bit more about that question because I think it um, is of some significance. Before I do that, I'll just show you a couple of other examples of manuscript views of the city from that period. This is a, this is a manuscript view from 1556, which shows the figure of the artist in the foreground painting the view from a real viewpoint, which is the Mokatham Hills. And here you have an idea of the, of the level of detail that he went into. Again, it's a very large original view. You have a series of manuscript views which accompanied um, uh, manuscripts of uh, Piri Rais, the famous Turkish admiral. Um, his book called the Kitabi Bahriya, the, the Book of the Seas, had a number of illustrations of cities. And Cairo was, in fact, known to Piri Rais personally because he accompanied Selim uh, when the Ottomans invaded Egypt. And it was also the site of his own execution at the age of 84 when he had failed to stop the Portuguese from um, spreading through the Indian Ocean. He was made the master of the Red Sea area by Selim, but he didn't do his job, so he was executed here. Here you see an Ottoman city with Ottoman roofs, Ottoman mosques, Ottoman minarets, all of these things which uh, didn't actually exist in Cairo. So there's no walls. You see that the city has no walls. There is the aqueduct, pyramids, a few things, but generally speaking, uh, it's, it's not really Cairo. Here again, the same sort of thing in a different manuscript. The most detailed view where you do actually have walls surrounding the city, is a much later view from the 17th century. This one is from the Walters Art Gallery. What do we know about Matteo Pagano himself? Well, we know that he, uh, he lived in Venice at this address. He print worked at Venice, uh, an address quite close to um, the, the, the uh, Ducal Palace, Doge's Palace, and he produced city views, amongst other things. This is another one he made of Venice. Um, he specialized as well in, in very large prints. These are quite large images of, of uh, Suleiman and, and his wife, Roxolana. Uh, so there was a great interest that, that the Venetians had in anything related to Turkish culture and the explanation of Turkish culture. So it was a, it was a good subject. Uh, he produced this enormous print of the Doge's procession through Venice, four meters long. But I'd like you to just notice what there is in the background here. We have Turks and probably Mamluks, looking directly down on the Doge in the audience of this procession. So some, some scholars have argued that actually uh, 
the presence of, of Turks and, and Mamluks in Venice was probably, you know, very few of them there. But I think that you either have to accept that they were there in perhaps more numbers than we believe, or else this was a very deliberate political statement of some sort that to juxtapose the, the foreigners with the, the Doge in this um, way. Venice's enormous trade network around uh, the East does explain to a certain extent the interest in the creation of these city views in the 15th and 16th centuries. And the audience for these views could range from uh, merchants, sedentary merchants, or even geographers, humanist scholars, uh, perhaps even the sort of aristocrats would be interested in, in collecting these, these images. Um, and that there's uh, information to show that there are many, many more city views than actually survive to this day. Large views were collected also for the purpose of display in uh, rooms of cities. Uh, many Renaissance palaces had rooms that were called the Room of the Cities, uh, where frescoes uh, with these views uh, were painted. And there was one in Mantua where there was a scene of Cairo 18 feet long, uh, which which uh, had more or less the same subject matter, we know, as the view that we have on the wall behind us here, done by Matteo Pagano. The date, final part of this talk, I'm sure you're all eager to leave, um, the, the dating of this view. I think it's more complicated than I originally thought when I um, studied this in detail some years ago. Um, there are a few things that I should remind everybody of, some, some key dates. Uh, one is that the Ottomans arrived in Egypt in 1517, and they therefore displaced the Mamluks, who were the, the Venice's main trading partners in the, in the region. And there is nothing Ottoman in this view. That's something we should bear in mind. Not even a minaret, not even an Ottoman minaret, which is the first thing that they started to build wherever they went with the, with the minarets. If you look at this view in a sort of archaeological way, in terms of a printed surface, you'll see that there are some strange dis discrepancies. At the top, in the title itself, you'll see on the right a completely different weight of font from on the section of text which says Descritio. So something funny has been going on here. Somebody's been tampering with the, with the, the printing matrix itself. And you can see also that the famous rubbish mounds, the Monte di Scovazze, are represented here with four different kinds of font, which seems a little bit odd. They're four, they appear in four different uh, formats. We have one or two very large, well, actually one very large chunk of text, this huge block of text, which seems to have been inserted into the landscape, cutting off fields and things. Generally speaking, the little block of text on the right is a good example at the top. Uh, the, the text blocks respect the, uh, the composition of the graphic composition, but this block of text, which refers to the pyramids, has been inserted as a plug in the wooden printing block. So that is uh, a text that was, in fact, copied from another work uh, done by the Italian architect Sebastiano Serlio in 1544, uh, copied and inserted into our view. There are other little telltale signs. These are remnants of an earlier key to um, a lettered key rather than a numbered key to the set of, of, of legends that has been superseded by um, later legends. The depictions of uh, historical importance and interest are also to be found always at the top of the view. So at the top, the, the areas outlined in red are those areas which I believe were things that were added to an earlier uh, image of the city. So they're marginal sections of the view, where you could, in fact, insert a wooden plug, which is what is quite commonplace uh, in, in, in the Renaissance printmaking, in the 16th century printmaking, to do this. Um, and it wouldn't have affected the, um, the actual composition of the, of the view itself. Who could have done that? Well, there's one possibility. We have a signature of, uh, of somebody called Giovanni Domenico uh, from Greece, from a, a place called Methone or Med Modene from Greece, who is also known as uh, Zorzi. He was a painter and cartographer who worked with Pagano on other projects, but he never went to Egypt, so he obviously never collected the, the images for the, um, for the view itself. But he may have been responsible for renumbering uh, 
adding these plugs, things like that. What other precedents do we have for this sort of thing? Well, we have this very interesting um, object, which is the world uh, map, uh, the world view, also printed in Venice um, a little bit later on in the 16th century, which was intended uh, as a gift to the sons of Suleiman the Magnificent. It's called the Haji Ahmed world map, and it's entirely written in Turkish. Um, this map is interesting because there was a, a rethink on the part of the Venetian authorities, and they destroyed all of the copies that they had printed of this, uh, of this map. They didn't give them to the sons of Suleiman the Magnificent, but they kept the printing blocks. And 335 years later, they were refound, and a few prints were made from those original blocks. So just to give you an idea of the extraordinary longevity of the, of the potential longevity of the printing matrix, so I don't think if you had a CD now, it would be around in 350 years' time. But with these blocks, they were around. Um, so it's entirely possible that blocks from an earlier printing could survive and be refound and modified by a printer um, some years later. And this is, in fact, what I think happened, because the blocks themselves form the major part of the investment in this uh, operation. That just shows you a detail of the text of, of this particular um, world map. That map was made as a present, a diplomatic present. Um, and I think that it's entirely possible that the, uh, the initial view that formed the basis of the one that I've been talking about tonight, the the one that Pagano may have found and added information to to make it more up-to-date. The original view may have been created for uh, one of uh, two Mamluk sultans, the last two Mamluk sultans of Egypt who are seen here in European representations of the end of the 16th century, Sultan al-Ghuri on, on the uh, left and uh, Sultan Kait Bey. Is there any proof for this on the map? Can we find any, anything on the view that would corroborate this theory? Well, yes, there are one or two pieces of information. Uh, one is this particular legend here, which refers to the, the palace of, in Venetian, Kamsul Kamsumeya, which is translatable as, as Khansu Khamsameya, um, 500 men he commanded. Um, and he was a Mamluk of, of, a, of, a, of somebody called Tarabai. And he's a known historical figure who actually participated against uh, in, a, in an uprising after the death of Kite Bay in 1496. Now, that's a very particular piece of historical data that is unlikely to have survived in, in, uh, in memory until 1547. Um, so I would use that as a piece of uh, the argument to suggest that actually the people who made this view were in Cairo uh, at that time, roughly, at the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century. Another piece of evidence is the, the, uh, the aqueduct that we see represented here. We know that in 1508, the Sultan al-Ghuri added a very large structure, an octagonal structure at the end of the aqueduct uh, to pump water up to the level of the top of the aqueduct so it could tr be transferred to the citadel. Now, this does not appear on the view, so, uh, and it was a very well-known building and very, very often described building. So I would argue that actually the production of the image that we have today uh, started at this time, at the end of uh, the Mamluk period, uh, and the blocks were refound um, at, the end, at, the, at the middle of the, of the 16th century and reused by a printer who had his eye on the chance to make some money out of uh, a reprinting with some Ottoman modifications to suit the present day. The recalibration of the view also allows us to explain one or two anomalies, such as this, uh, which was a, a view printed in Venice in 1519, which is essentially the same composition as the much larger view printed by Matteo Pagano, but may have been copying a now lost original print uh, taken from the first lot of blocks. Why is this view important? Well, it remained the standard view of the most important city in the Islamic world until uh, 1800, at least. 
It appeared in numerous recensions, that's to say, in numerous different reprintings and different formats for the next 250 years. And it was not actually replaced until the beginning of the 19th century. So this is just one of the more famous um, uh, recensions, which is, was produced in 1572 in an atlas of, uh, which included city views from around the world. Um, details were also copied. You can see here on the left, there's a, a detail showing date pickers from the, from the view, which has actually been magically morphed into the image on the right, where people would have actually copied the figures, traced over them, and then flipped them and reprinted them in a different uh, publication. What was it replaced by? Well, it was replaced by the first great uh, map of Cairo, the first detailed map of Cairo produced by the French. Uh, this expedition that I've referred to uh, carried out by Napoleon with his group of scholars and surveyors. Uh, and they <laughs> created the most detailed uh, image of the city, which was a real plan calculated uh, by using all of the minarets as points of triangulation. That was their method to actually describe the, uh, the topography of the city was to use the minarets as the points uh, by which they could create this, this astonishing piece of information. That's all I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I'm sure you're desperately glad to, to finish. <laughs> and so so uh, thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I hope I've managed to illuminate a little bit of, of what Cairo was like in the 16th century. Thank you. Thank you.